So that being said, our next speaker, uh, James Aaron Rice, IWP class of 2020, is the legislative director for U.S. Senator Chuck Grassley of Iowa, uh, for whom he has worked since June of 2000, and uh, he is an Iowa native. James oversees Senator Grassley's legislative team while also serving as the chief advisor to Senator Grassley on foreign policy. This includes supporting the senator in his role as co-chair of the Senate Baltic Freedom Caucus, where James coordinates with three Baltic embassies and Baltic American organizations uh, to build on the strong U.S.-Baltic partnership. James's previous professional experience includes positions in the Iowa Senate, uh, an internship with the British Conservative Party, and work on various political campaigns. James has received a public diplomacy award from the Estonian Ministry of Foreign Affairs for his contributions to understanding of Estonia in the United States and has been awarded the National Defense System of the Republic of Lithuania Medal of Merit for his work on Baltic security. He's been selected as a National Review Institute Washington Fellow, a Hillsdale College Madison Fellow, an Atlantic Council Eurasia Congressional Fellow, and a Penn Kemble Democracy Forum Fellow through the National Endowment for Democracy. That's a lot of fellows. <laughs> James received a BA from Drake University in Des Moines with majors in political science and history and an MA in statecraft and international affairs from IWP. And James will be talking about Ukraine. So first, uh, I have to make the standard disclaimer that I'm speaking on my own behalf, not on behalf of my boss or anyone else. Uh, the second disclaimer is that, yes, that's me standing on top of a burnt out Russian tank in Ukraine in August. I was there with a uh, Estonian led private sector uh, aid convoy bringing trucks to the Ukrainian military. So you know where I'm coming from then. Um, and also, this, this talk is not primarily about uh, American national interest, although we certainly do have national interest in this. I'm going into the origin of the conflict itself, and we can talk more about American foreign policy um, if you would like. So, but first of all, to understand the current conflict, it's important to understand that there has been a war over history that well predates the current kinetic war. Uh, Putin has said for decades that Ukraine is not a real country. Right, how do I advance here? <laughs> it's not, this isn't, okay. So Putin published this article in 2021 where he lays out the view uh, in detail that Ukraine and Russia really are uh, one country. Um, and he really believes that his own sort of twisted view of history, which explains a lot of his motivations and his missteps. Uh, he expects Ukrainians to think like Russians and to consider themselves Russians, but they don't. Uh, Russians and Ukrainians have a very different history, and this results in a very different mentality. Uh, moreover, Russia's national origin myth essentially lays claim to Ukrainian history. So let's dive into that history. There, uh, and this, this common history is a civilization called Kievan Rus. Uh, and this dates to the Viking Age in the 9th century, when Vikings were expanding outward and selling new lands. They were invading uh, England, but they also came down and, um, and settled in uh, the area that's now Russia and Ukraine. Uh, so, and according to legend, a Viking named Rurik was invited to rule over the warring tribes uh, in the area of Novograd, what's now northern Russia. And then the next generation of the house of Rurik uh, uh, took Kiev and ruled over local Slavic tribes, making Kiev the center of this, of this civilization. Um, let's see, aha. Uh, and then a major development was the acceptance of Eastern Orthodox Christianity from Byzantium uh, by a descendant of the House of Rurik, whose Norse name was Valdemar, uh, but is known in, to Ukrainians as Volodymyr the Great and to Russians as Saint Vladimir. And you see here we have a, uh, uh, the monument in Kiev. Uh, the bad pictures are the ones that I took. Uh, so this, this one is a picture of the, the, what currently looks like the, the, the monument in Kiev to Prince Volodymyr. And then Putin built um, a monument to Vladimir the Great right across from the Kremlin uh, in 2016. Um, and uh, here's how Putin talks about this history. Uh, the Russians, Ukrainians, and Belarusians are all descendants of ancient Rus, which is true, uh, which was the largest state in Europe. 
Slavic and other tribes across the vast territory from Ladoga, Novgorod, to Peskov, to uh, Kiev. He pronounces it, the, you know, he spells it the Russian way in the English version of his, of his, uh, uh, of his paper. And uh, Chernigov were bound together by one language, which we now refer to as Old Russian. There is laying claim to it saying it's Russian was the language they spoke, a, a version of Russian. Economic ties, the rule of the princes of the Rurik dynasty, and after the baptism of Rus, the Orthodox faith. The spiritual choice made by Saint Vladimir, who was both Prince of Novgorod and Grand Prince of Kiev, uh, still largely determines our affinity to today. And he says, the throne of Kiev held a dominant position in ancient Rus. Um, this had been the custom since the late ninth century. The tale of bygone years captured for posterity the words of Oleg the prophet about Kiev, let it be the mother of all Russian cities. Now that, this is an anachronism uh, because the uh, uh, modern Russia grew out of Muscovy uh, or Moscow, which was not founded when those words were written. The, uh, the tale of uh, bygone years uh, predates the founding of what became Russia. And so they didn't say the mother of all Russian cities. He would have said he's conflating Rus with Russia. Um, and so here is a map of uh, uh, the Kievan Rus uh, principalities. Uh, and it's overlaid on, a, on the current uh, uh, boundaries. And you note there's no, there's no Moscow. The, the northern cities were Novgorod and Vladimir. Um, and the, the traditional date for the founding of Kiev is as early as 482. Uh, Moscow was founded in 1283. Uh, so there's the different principalities here. They all fought with each other, but loosely fell under the authority of Kiev. It's, it's complicated. This is pre-modern you know, pre times. Uh, so they were all part of one civilization. They warred with each other. There was a tradition of the, uh, um, the different like the, the, the oldest son would, would, would take uh, Kiev and then, then they would have other principalities to go to the other sons. And then they, if one died, often not from natural causes, they would, um, they would, they would then sort of um, cascade and, and switch places and, they would, and the, the oldest would then take over Kiev. Um, but this was, it was essentially one civilization, uh, uh, but centered on, on Kiev being the most important part. Um, and so, you know, until the 1800s, we didn't have the modern concept of nation states. So we have to be careful not to look back at this time and think about, oh, what was, where, where is it, was this a country at that time? Not, not in the modern sense, but um, so whether, you know, even a country or an entity could be considered an independent state or not is kind of murky. There's a lot of gray in terms of that. The, the relationships weren't that cut and dried. Uh, and ethnicity doesn't necessarily correspond to political borders. So the idea of nation state is a more modern concept. But... Um, so what, what, uh, what became Russia, though, arose thanks to the Mongol invasion of this Rus civilization. Uh, the most famous Mongol is Genghis Khan, and his name is synonymous with fear and savagery. So everybody kind of thinks of Genghis Khan, and you know, the imagery comes into mind of, of these marauding hordes that are, that are coming and, and going to sack your city. And the Mongols' MO was that if, you, if, if they were coming and you immediately accepted Mongol rule and agreed to pay tribute, uh, your city would be spared. So, but if you resist at all, even if you try to surrender later, your city will be destroyed and the inhabitants massacred. They'll burn it down, completely raise it to the ground. Uh, and that's essentially the same MO that you have seen in, uh, from Russians today in Chechnya, Syria, and in Ukraine. And I don't think that's necessarily a coincidence. Uh, the next generation of Mongols uh, invaded uh, Kiev and Rus in, in that, same, that same way. Uh, Kiev was sacked in, in 1240. Uh, and that was the end of the Kievan Rus civilization as, as it was known. Uh, and then Muscovy rose to prominence. It, it wasn't one of the main principalities, but it rose to prominence by collaborating with the Mongols and collecting tribute from other, the other Rus areas on behalf of the Mongols. And I believe that that is key to understanding Russian history and, and Russian mentality. So let's, uh, let's fast forward a couple hundred years, and the Mongol Empire has now uh, fractured apart. And... Uh, as, you know, but as it expanded, uh, the Mongol Empire absorbed multiple tribes. So the Mongol Empire you know, wasn't just ethnic Mongolians. Uh, it had absorbed a lot of tribes, including uh, the Turkic-speaking Tatars. Uh, and when the empire fractured, the Tatars formed their own polity in what is today southern Ukraine, the Crimean Peninsula. See, you, you see down here uh, the Crimean Khanate. And uh, it has the Crimean Peninsula, but areas to the north of it as well. And then the Grand Dukes of Lithuania take advantage of the situation to take over much of what today is uh, Belarus and Ukraine. See, Lithuania is bigger than Muscovy. The Lithuanians remember this time very fondly. Uh, they will remind you that there was a time when they were 
the, a dominant power. Um, but the main language spoken in Lithuania, uh, the Lithuania on this map, is uh, at that time was not Lithuanian, but Rus or Ruthenian, the ancestor of modern Ukrainian Belarusian. Most of the inhabitants spoke, um, spoke the ancestor of, of Ukrainian Belarusian and were of Orthodox faith. Um, then uh, uh, Muscovy, uh, you know, leveraged his wealth and power that it had gained by collaborating with the Mongols to become a significant regional power. Um, so Ivan III, or Ivan the Great, styled himself as the Grand Prince of Moscow and all Russia. And this is where the term Russia comes in. And the, uh, he's, the term Russia is intentionally co-opting the, the, the prestige of Kiev and Rus. Uh, Ivan III started what Russians call the Gathering of Russian Lands, meaning the former lands of Rus. Um, and at this time, uh, we see Moscow is, is claiming that uh, Russians start this notion that Moscow is the third Rome after the fall of Constantinople. So you got Rome, Constantinople, Constantinople falls to the Ottomans, and then Moscow is now the third Rome, kind of maybe passing through Kiev. Um, but uh, we see the beginning of imperial pretensions here on the part of, uh, on the part of Russians. Um, so, and then you have Ivan IV, or Ivan the Terrible, who was the first to use the term Tsar of Russia, which is derived from the word Caesar. So again, um, you know, he's, they're, they're claiming the mantle of, uh, of the Roman Empire. Uh, he sacked the Republic of Novgorod and massacred the inhabitants in the Mongol, the Mongol style. Uh, according to, uh, so in, uh, that's in contrast to Muscovy, uh, which adopted this Mongol style absolutism, Novgorod had actually evolved into a republic with early sort of proto-democratic institutions and traditions. So uh, Novgorod was, had a very different sort of trajectory. Um, and so you have to wonder if Muscovy hadn't sacked uh, Novgorod, you know, the history of that part of the world would have been very different. Uh, meanwhile, uh, in Poland and uh, Lithuania, they enter a personal union. The, the monarchs marry each other uh, and they become sort of one state or two parts of, a, of one, one sort of entity. Um, and then that evolves into the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. And that, that entity had, had divisions of power. There wasn't an absolute monarch. There were, there were nobles. There was, there was some separation of power and an early sort of an early type of parliament and a concept of, of rights, that uh, people would have rights independent of the state uh, had, had started to evolve. Um, and so that's the polity that controlled most of um, uh, modern Ukraine for centuries. And I think that's an important, an important factor. Um, so Ukraine's national origin myth, of course, claims the heritage of Kiev and Rus. Uh, they have Kiev, so why not? Uh, and, but also leans heavily on a Cossack identity. Uh, and the Cossacks were a free people. They were often runaway serfs who lived on the steppe in eastern Ukraine, uh, which is sort of like our Wild West. There was, it's a, uh, a wide open area, sparsely populated, very difficult for anybody to govern. Um, and uh, this area was nominally under the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, but the Cossacks were largely self-governing, and they elected their leader from among their ranks, which they called a hetman. Uh, the Cossacks held special privileges in return for fighting for the Commonwealth. So they were farmers, but also warriors, sort of mercenaries for hire. Um, they had a long history of switching uh, temporary alliances to play local powers off each other to retain maximum autonomy. Uh, the Cossack entity, uh, which called itself the Zaporizhian host, was the first entity documented to be called Ukraine. There are documents in the time where different countries refer to this area as Ukraine. Um, and uh, 1648, the, the hetman, the elected hetman, Bogdan Kamelnitsky, led a Cossack uprising against the Polish king in an alliance with the Crimean Tatars to the south. Uh, they felt that the, uh, um, that the, uh, let's see, give me advance. Hmm. There's, there he is. Um, they, there was always this tension, the, the, the Poles were Catholic and they felt like they were trying to be, you know, they were, the, the, the Polos were trying to convert the local Orthodox population in, um, into, uh, to be Catholic and they felt like they, are, they were losing some of their traditional autonomy. So they, they aligned with the Tatars, which actually were their historic enemies. They had been, they had, they'd been fighting the Tatars on behalf of the Commonwealth because uh, the Tatars would raid, they would take, they would take slaves and, and, and sell them in the Ottoman slave markets. Um, but then they switched and they aligned with the Tatars against the Poles. 
Uh, but then that alliance broke down. Uh, they felt the Tatars were not coming through on their end of the bargain. So they needed to find a new partner and they sought alliance with Orthodox Russia. Um, so then you have the Periaslav Agreement of uh, 1654 where Hemelitsky and the Cossacks swore allegiance to the Tsar. Uh, and based on their experience, they expected the Pol, you know, with, they, they'd been used to dealing with the Polish king where they would say, okay, in return for fighting for you, we have certain rights and you need to respect our autonomy and our ability to elect our own hetman. They expected the Tsar's representative in, in this uh, example to, um, to make some sort of oath or guarantee their special privileges in return for their swearing alliance. But the Tsar's representative was like, I'm not authorized to do that. You have to just swear alliance to the Tsar. So that's a red flag right there. In fact, there's some stories that the, the Cossacks thought about walking out and then didn't. Um, but the Tsar was an absolute monarch. So everyone, regardless of social status, was a servant of the Tsar. So unlike the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, there's no concept of rights, no property, uh, even nobles didn't have, you know, they, everything they had was, was from the Tsar and the Tsar could take it away. Um, and the Ukrainian Cossacks saw the Periaslav Agreement as just another alliance that, they, that would last as long as the Russians held up their end of the bargain uh, and it sought and suited the Cossacks' interests. But the, uh, in Russian mythology to this day, it is seen as the, quote, uh, reunification, reun reunification of Ukraine with Russia. Uh, and here we have a monument. Um, there, the, this was built in 1982 as the monument to commemorate the reunification of Ukraine with Russia. In 1991, after Ukraine became independent, they changed the name to the People's Friendship Arch. And so you got a, a statue of a, of a Ukrainian and a, and a Russian worker joining hands and, and being together. This is the picture I took uh, in August. And as of May 14, 2022, the statue of the Russian and Ukrainian together is gone and it's now the arch of freedom of the Ukrainian people. Um, so different, very different concept of what, what that, what that uh, agreement was and what that history is. Um, then uh, you, you, know, you have, surprise, surprise, the erosion of autonomy for the Cossacks started right after the agreement. Uh, the Tsar felt like he had the authority to do whatever he wanted to do. Um, and it got to a point where the Cossacks attempted to switch uh, uh, um, alliances because they felt like that the Russians weren't holding up their end of the bargain and that their, their autonomy was being eroded. Uh, and Ivan Mazepa was the hetman at the time and he tried to align with the Swedes. The, um, he is a national hero in Ukraine. He's considered a traitor by Russians. Um, this was, uh, uh, so then you're gonna fast forward here. Catherine the Great uh, finally abolished the office of Hetman in 1764. She said, we're done with that. We're, we're abolishing that autonomy entirely. And here's what she said. Every effort should be made to eradicate them and their age from memory, meaning the Cossack Hetmanate. Uh, and so she's not called the Great by Ukrainians. Um, so uh, Putin is part of a long, a long line, a long tradition of Russian leaders that have tried unsuccessfully to convince Ukrainians that they are actually Russians. Uh, it doesn't start with him, Catherine, even before. So um, uh, she also conquered the Crimean Khanate uh, from the Tatars and then settled the, the sparsely populated areas, what's now southern Ukraine uh, and the Crimean, you know, Crimean Peninsula with Russians. Um, and then you get the um, Valuev Circular, which was issued in 1863, which banned educational materials in the Ukrainian language. Uh, because they were concerned about uh, that, that, that teaching literacy in Ukrainian uh, could uh, uh, reinforce the, quote, separatist intentions of the little Russians. Little Russians is what Russians call Ukrainians. Um, uh, and they have other condescending terms toward their, their brothers, quote unquote. Um, they're little brothers at best. Um, and the value of circular read in part, a separatist little Russian language never existed, does not exist, and shall not exist, and the tongue used by commoners, Ukrainian, is nothing but Russian corrupted by the influence of Poland. So, I mean, it's true, Ukrainian was influenced by Polish, but Russian was uh, influenced by Old Church Slavonic, which is actually a South Slavic uh, language. It's Bulgarian is the closest modern language to that. Uh, so they basically you have languages that evolved separately. Uh, Ukrainian, I, I'm told, I'm not a linguist, but retains some features of the old Rus language that had been lost in Russian. So mm -hmm. bottom line, the two languages evolved separately, not one out of the other. Language is often used as part of this, this, um, this, this contest over whether you are a, a separate person or, or a separate country or not. 
Um, but the two languages are not mutually intelligible. I'm told Russians cannot understand Ukrainian. Um, and uh, one way of comparing languages is lexical similarity, so counting words that are similar in both languages. Lexical similarity with Ukrainian is 84% uh, with Belarusian, which makes sense, they, they're, they're closely related. 70% uh, with Polish, 66% with Slovak, and only 62% with Russian. Um, that's not the only way of comparing languages, but it's, it's one measure. Uh, but it's also important to note that language does not equal ethnicity or loyalty. So Russian speakers in Ukraine doesn't make them Russians. Uh, there has been a long policy of Russification, um, and uh, you know, particularly in the East, which was under the Russian rule the longest. But in, and I think the way to think about it is you think about um, in Ireland, most Irish people speak English as their first language now. The Irish language has, has been reduced significantly in, in, in terms of the number of people in Ireland who speak it, but that doesn't mean that native English speakers in Ireland consider themselves English or want to be, uh, want to be part of England, obviously, if you know that, that history. Um, so uh, uh, where does uh, Ukrainian national identity come from? Uh, the 19th century saw national movements throughout Europe. There was the flowering of nations, Ukraine, um, in both the area that uh, the, there was a partition of Poland, so the, the Polish, um, there was Polish controlled areas still throughout this time, and then that they were partitioned, and Austria um, uh, controlled a good chunk of, um, uh, of, of Ukraine, and then there's the, the chunk that Russia uh, controlled, and in both of those parts of Ukraine, there were these national movements of Ukrainians that were, were um, uh, uh, you know, national movements that, that, that of Ukrainian identity, asserting Ukrainian identity. And in fact, um, here we have uh, the Taras Shevchenko Memorial, um, also a bad picture, so it means I took it. Um, it was, <laughs> I took this in 2014 uh, on the way either to or from the Russian embassy. Um, uh, they had just invaded Crimea, and um, I went with some Baltic friends to let them know what we thought about that. Um, but uh, Teres uh, Shevchenko was a major Ukrainian national figure from this time. Uh, he was born a serf. Uh, he had a Polish landlord uh, who took him to St. Petersburg, uh, and there he, the, uh, it was discovered that he had tremendous artistic talents, both, um, both uh, painting and drawing and, uh, and uh, poetry. Uh, so he was freed, uh, uh, and then he, um, he wrote, he published poems about Ukraine in Ukrainian, uh, which was sort of a revolutionary thing to do. Uh, so the fact that he wrote poetry in what Russians saw as a peasant dialect not suitable for literature was a strong assertion of national identity. Um, then after World War II, um, I mean, well, sorry, World War I, the Russian Empire was weakened. Uh, this is the time when the Baltic states managed to get their independence. They had to fight some wars, but they managed to get break, break free. Um, they had a similar awakening of national identity. Uh, and then there was also a short-lived independent Ukrainian states declared in both the Austrian and, and Russian uh, controlled parts of Ukraine, um, and uh, but the Bolsheviks didn't let that didn't let that stand. Uh, uh, but Lenin recognized the reality of the national consciousness, and he tried to harness it by by sort of billing the Soviet Union as a multinational state, with Ukraine being a separate republic. Um, Lenin, um, sorry, Putin has a, a really uh, distaste for Lenin, and he claims that Lenin creates modern Ukraine. He says that. Therefore, modern Ukraine is entirely the product of the Soviet era. We know and remember well that it was shaped for a significant part in the lands of historical Russia. To make sure of that, it's, it's enough to look at the boundaries of the lands reunited with the Russian state in the 17th century and the territory of the Ukrainian Soviet Social Republic when it left the Soviet Union. Um, but that's, that's, that's nonsense. Uh, modern Ukraine matches closely with historical Ukraine plus the, the Crimean Khanate. Um, Lenin was simply recognizing reality that, that was evident at the time. Ukrainians saw themselves as a separate country. They had declared a, a, an independent country. Um, and uh, so in that respect, at least, despite Lenin adhering to a philosophy totally at odds with human nature, he was more in touch with reality than Putin is today. Um, so there was, uh, there was briefly a resurgence of teaching of Ukrainian language and culture under uh, the beginnings of Soviet-occupied uh, Soviet Ukraine. And then, um, then Stalin came in and he repressed all expressions of non-Russian identity and purged Ukrainian Bolshevik. Stalin was very opposed to um, national identity. He was a Russified uh, Georgian, but he himself hated anybody with national sentiment other than a Russian identity. Um, and he, um, Stalin also launched what Ukrainians call the Holodomor, or murder by starving in Ukrainian. Uh, and um, they seized every bit of, Ukraine, of grain from Ukrainian peasants 
Uh, and so, uh, you know, I think it's, there's, there was many reasons for, for this policy, but certainly a, a, a benefit in Stalin's mind was the fact that, that you were murdering lots of Ukrainians who have a national identity that you don't approve of. Um, and so let's now fast forward to the breakup of the Soviet Union. Uh, Ukrainians, including Russian-speaking Ukrainians, had different views of uh, interest of their of what their their interests, their personal interests were uh, from from the Russians, and that led to seeking total independence from the Soviet Union. So, um, by contrast, leaders of Russia and other republics, except for the Baltics, um, envisioned retaining some sort of union, uh, and so did so did President Bush at the time, who was afraid of a Yugoslavia with nukes situation. He made the uh, famous chicken uh, chicken Kiev speech where he urged Ukrainians to not break away. Um, but they, they didn't listen. So um, you, the Ukrainian Rado voted for independence and then uh, set up a referendum to ratify that. The um, results surprised everyone. They shocked Gorbachev. Gorbachev actually convinced himself that this, that this, um, this referendum would fail. Uh, and um, I mean, Yeltsin was surprised, apparently, that the, the, the Donbass, which you hear a lot about now, voted overwhelmingly for independence. So if you look in the east there, you see 83% in that, that far eastern part that Putin claims are really populated by Russians who want to be part of Russia. Um, every, every part of, of Ukraine voted overwhelmingly for independence. The closest was Crimea was 54%, um, but still, still voted for independence. And then, of course, you see Western Ukraine, the parts that weren't part, uh, weren't part of the Soviet Union until uh, World War II, um, those are you know, overwhelming. 98%, um, but everywhere it was overwhelming. Um, and uh, that, that really put the nail in the coffin of the Soviet Union. Um, they kept saying, well, we need to form some kind of new union. And uh, the, the uh, Kravchuk, the Ukrainian president at the time was like, we voted for independence, I can't. People decided we're not, we're not signing up to any kind of new union. Um, so the next big turning point, 20, 2004 Orange Revolution, there was a widespread belief that the uh, election results were, were falsified in favor of the pro-Russian Viktor Yanukovych over the uh, more Western Viktor Yushchenko. In response to mass protests, the election was rerun, leading to a victory by Yushchenko. Um, Putin likes to complain about, about color revolutions, which he, which he believes are, um, are always orchestrated by the West and the CAA in some kind of conspiracy. Um, and then there was infighting amongst the uh, the pro-Western parties that led to Yanukovych winning the next election fair and square. Um, Ukraine was on the verge of uh, finalizing an association agreement with the European Union, which is very popular in Ukraine. Uh, Yanukovych <coughs> was poised to sign it, and then he got a call from Putin, and he said, you can't sign it. And so he suddenly reversed course. That led to a popular outcry in November 2013. Uh, it's called the Euromaidan, after the Maidan Independence Square in Kiev or they, the Ukrainians often call it the revolution of dignity. And if you think about it, Ukrainians were tired of the humiliation of having the will of Ukrainian people thwarted by corrupt leaders who were subservient to Moscow, a foreign, a foreign state. So Yanukovych used special riot police and snipers to try to suppress the protests, killing over 100 a, a protesters, uh, which just uh, led to even greater popular outrage. Uh, and in response, the Ukrainian parliament voted to remove the president, and, and he absconded to Russia. Uh, the Petro Poroshenko, there was an interim president, uh, but then Petro Poroshenko was late elected president in a free and fair election. Uh, he served for one term. Then he was defeated for re-election by President Zelensky. Um, so Ukraine is on its sixth elected president since 1991, and only um, one president was re-elected during that time. Uh, three incumbents were defeated for re-election. Uh, by contrast, Russia's had uh, two presidents total, and no, no one's been defeated for you know, the elections that they hold. Um, Putin claims that uh, you know, the Maidan protest was orchestrated by the West, the CIA. He, de he refers derisively to the Kiev regime, implying that, um, uh, that it's illegitimate, and he says it was all installed by a Western-led coup, but we've seen that there have been several free and fair elections, and so that's, that's nonsense. Uh, but it's clear that Putin, I think he believes this stuff to a certain extent. He can't grasp the idea of an organic, organic expression of widespread popular opinion against Moscow in the, in the former Russian empire. He doesn't allow for agencies, in, uh, smaller countries having agency. He thinks that um, you're either in the Russia sphere of influence or the, the sphere of influence of the US or the collective West. I remember once talking to, um, to a Latvian, I think it may have even been Vitor 2014, 
and they were telling me the story about how a Russian had come to them and said, oh, you're just, you're just puppets of the Americans. You do whatever they say. And he, and he said he told them, that's, that's crazy. Um, we want the Americans to pay more attention to us. Far from being puppets who are, who are doing what Americans want, we wish the Americans were more present, had, had troops on the ground, had more, paid more attention to, to Latvia. But the Russians have a hard time uh, grasping that, that these countries are making sovereign choices and they're not choosing Russia. Um, so you have this Putin statement. I am confident that true sovereignty of Ukraine is possible only in partnership with Russia. They're naturally part of the Russian sphere. They, they can't have any kind of sovereignty outside of being a subservient to Russia. So when he lost his puppet in Yanukovych, Putin, that's when Putin invaded and annexed Crimea and started the war in Donbass. Um, and if, if, at that time, under Yanukovych, Ukraine was militarily neutral, wasn't seeking NATO membership, but Putin was threatened by Ukraine's movement toward EU, uh, toward an economic agreement with the EU, and away from his political and economic sphere of influence. So you hear a lot about, oh, it's NATO expansion. NATO wasn't on the table at the time. It was, it was the overall sphere of influence that Ukraine was moving away from. Uh, but it's only natural that Ukrainians, given the choice, would want closer relations with Europe. Their outlook is shaped by the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, not the Mongol modern of governance in Russia. Uh, so Putin's aggression is not based on any perceived threat to the Russian Federation in its current borders. It's a response to seeing Russia's empire slipping away for good. Uh, Putin invaded, remember, Georgia back in 2008 before uh, when it had elected a pro-Western uh, pro president. Um, and then six months later, the Obama administration launched the disastrous reset policy with Russia. Uh, and it's, it's no wonder that uh, Putin thought he could get away with invading Crimea in, in, in 2014 after uh, after that experience of nothing happening, not only nothing happening after the invasion of Georgia, which was sending troops to, to fight alongside uh, Americans uh, in, in Iraq and Afghanistan, um, there, was this, there was this attempt by the Obama administration to reach out a hand and say, well, maybe they'll reciprocate if we tell them, like, you know, we actually want to be nice to you, maybe they'll reciprocate. Absolute the wrong thing you want to do with, with, with the Russians. They understand strength. They, they perceive that as weakness. So. Um, and then in 2014, there was some condemnation, but uh, the, the Obama administration denied Ukraine any kind, of, uh, any kind of weapons to defend themselves or retake territory and then urged Ukraine to seek a diplomatic solution. And I believe that that response led directly to the full-scale invasion in February 2022. Um, so Put Putin's misreading of Ukrainian society also fed his belief that he could take Kiev in three days. So I think he, he really believed some of his talking points. Uh, he underestimated the... the the strength and pervasiveness of uh, Ukrainian national identity. Uh, I think he thought he could topple Zelensky and his government and install a puppet, maybe annex parts of Ukraine to Russia, and most of the population would just go along. Uh, and then um, the, the Russian soldiers expected to be greeted with bread and salt, which is a traditional, a traditional welcome. And I was told when I visited uh, Bucha in August that uh, Russian soldiers didn't start the hor uh, a horrific cruelty right from the get-go. Uh, they, it wasn't until they realized the local population was not supportive, uh, and then that's when they started to per, uh, perpetrate horrific war crimes. Um, and I'm not suggesting that those were crimes of passion without premeditation. It's just that, I mean, the Russians brought in electri ele uh, electri uh, electrocution torture devices that were specially made for torture, so they were clearly intending that they were going to have to torture some people that, that had Ukrainian identity, but I think they, they underestimated how many people that they would... Uh, that would actually have Ukrainian national identity and, and would resist. Um, and so um, uh, there's another, there's a question that you know, might arise that since we've talked so much about how, how central Ukraine is to Russia's sense of national identity is whether therefore Russian ambitions are limited to Ukraine if, if uh, all they care about is taking Kiev uh, because of this mother of Russian cities. Um, I think Ukraine is key to Russia's imperial ambitions and mentality, but there, I don't think Russia's imperial ambitions stop with Ukraine. Um, so I've already mentioned the invasion of Georgia that preceded the invasion of Ukraine, but let's, um, let's look at what, uh, what Russians say. So Catherine the Great said, I have no way to defend my borders but to extend them. So like, oh my gosh, we're, on, we're bordering NATO, what the equivalent of NATO at the time, we need to extend to create a buffer, and then we Russify that and then, oh no, we're on the border with an unfriendly state, we need to extend further. It, it really, um, well, here's 
the borders of Russia do not end. That's what that, that's what that leads to. Uh, he actually said that it's very creepy. There was a, like a sort of geography bee and there was a little kid and he asked, they asked, well, where did Russia's borders end? And he gave a technical answer. He said, no, Russia's borders do not end. It's creepy, you can look it up on YouTube. Um, here's a billboard. Uh, Mikhail Hordakovsky was an uh, anti-Putin Russian that was jailed and then now lives in, in, in London, posted this. Um, and this is a billboard celebrating the Russian army and it, it says, our borders don't end anywhere. And then you have this quote by Václav Havel, uh, which I like a lot. I think that there's been a kind of Russian problem for many centuries that Russia doesn't n exactly know where it begins and where it ends. Um, I think that's very true. Um, and this is what uh, Zbigniew Brzezinski said. It cannot be stressed strongly enough that without Ukraine, Russia ceases to be an empire. But with Ukraine, uh, suborned and subordinated, Russia automatically becomes an empire. Uh, so Russia badly needs to undertake a post-imperial reckoning. Russians need to accept that Russia is not entitled to an imperial sphere of influence and to recognize the independent choices of other nations to break free of Russian influence. Uh, losing this current war badly is a necessary precondition for that process to have any shot of beginning. I'm not saying it's automatic or that, uh, but, um, but that's a precondition. Uh, and here is what Kaya Kallas, the Prime Minister of Estonia, says. If Putin wins, or if he even has the view that he's won this war, his appetite will only grow. So whether Russia can transform from an empire into a modern country will be up to Russians. Uh, we can't bank on it happening anytime soon. Uh, in the meantime, Russia's neighbors and their allies must be prepared to push back on Russian aggression wherever it rears up, or it'll only metastasize to a point where stopping it will become even more costly in blood and treasure. All right, so that, that's the presentation. Anybody have... Of questions. Okay. Okay, I have one question. <clears throat> Do you think Russian behavior and Central America is unique to the world or is it rather common? And would you make a comparison between a very powerful concept in American history during the night? Yeah, so yeah, he, there was sort of a, a, a two part whether Russian, whether uh, whether this this Russian uh, attitude is unique to Central Europe or whether it exists elsewhere and and to um, uh, compare it to the American concept of manifest destiny. Certainly, Russians say we're, what we're doing isn't any different than what Americans did. Uh, it is true that that. Uh, Russia is a land empire that expanded outward and encompassed other people. America also uh, moved westward. Um, I, I don't think that it's a one-to-one -one comparison, but it's, it's, uh, there's enough truth to it that, it, that, that it's a powerful argument for, uh, for Putin. I certainly don't, you know, I don't think that America is, um, is imperialistic uh, in, its, in its core. I don't think we seek to necessarily uh, you know, he always says we're we're trying to take over and exert influence on countries in Europe for for our own sake. I don't think that's true. I think I think America is founded on on a, a set of ideals as opposed to a um, uh, as opposed to being having this imperial uh, uh, sense of that you know we should just control for control's sake. Uh, so I think there's differences. I do think that um, I do think that Russia is not unique. I think some of these same lessons about you. Um, uh, uh, about understanding strength and portraying strength as, as, as being, um, I think weakness is provocative in many cases. I think that's true in dealing with uh, other uh, states that have imperial pretensions like Iran and China. Um, I think both of them feel they have an entitlement to control a certain sphere in their neighborhood. And to the extent that you do, they're um, consulate, you know, that there's, you sort of do conciliatory toward them and you reach out and you say, well, let's negotiate, let's negotiate. Uh, if you don't portray strength, they will just keep advancing. Um, so I think it's not unique to Russia. And I can talk to folks. Uh, I probably need to head back to work pretty soon, but I'll, I'll be around tonight too. So I'm happy to have conversations about this. Thank you.